Um, I was born in 1970. <laughs> and I grew up in a bar. Um, because in 1971, my father and his brother um, founded Collins Pub. In 1973, my parents were divorced, and I think there's causation there, not just correlation. Um, and the bar was an Irish pub because my dad's parents were born in Tipperary and Roscommon, and um, it had all the trappings of an Irish pub, including, I don't know, the signed copy of uh, a photo of Joe Namath. My dad was a huge, huge Jets fan. And um, it seemed that like meatloaf, like Bat Out of Hell, was always playing on the jukebox. Like all the time I had that song is like burned into my brain. But as a, as a little kid, I, I spent time at the Taps, and I was also the bat boy for the Collins, Club, uh, Collins Pub softball team. And I found this this morning just to prove that I'm right. Uh, <laughs> isn't that cute? <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> so when I was about 10, my dad decided to make the bar into a restaurant, right? And um, he did this, though, by doubling the bar space, like, which was, he, we had a single bar along the wall, and then all of a sudden we had this big horseshoe bar, in the, in the, and I was like, Dad, what's, what gives? And he's like, okay, I'm, I'm all about the food, but you make the money on the liquor, right? And um, guess what he served? big, the part of my dad's brilliance was he considered the lobster. Like, so here we are in New Jersey, um, and I can still see the neon signs on the window, steak, lobster. And um, he, did, he did well. And at 13, I started washing dishes, right? So it was a family thing. My cousin was you know, behind the bar, you know, doing the taps, and my aunt was the hostess, and here's young Darren um, washing lobster, I'm not washing lobsters, washing, <laughs> washing dishes, old school, no machines, you know, real, real washing. Um, and of course, the best thing was to be surrounded by waitresses at that time. I mean, I was 13 years old, I was the little cute you know, kid of the, whose, whose parents, or whose dad was the owner, and um, they would come and ruffle my hair, and I thought that was, that was really cool, um, until a waitress came and said, damn it, the spoon is dirty. Like, all of a sudden, my, like, uh, protected status as the, the son of the owner went right out the door. I don't make tips if this spoon goes out dirty, like I, and I will, I will never forget that moment. And I'll never forget my, my dad saying to me, like, as I, you know, now 15, 16, thinking about careers. And he said, promise me, you'll never get into the restaurant business. I will not, you're not going to be, um, um, the bar owner here. Um, anyway, um, that was, my, that was my story. So I, I feel like I'm imbued a little bit in the restaurant um, business. And when I think about what we've covered so far across the sacred and profane about the growing farmer, the seed sower, you know, the food coming from the soil, the inequities of that, the ecological consequences of that, the health impacts of that, and then yesterday, we took a really deep dive into the preparation of food, which was amazing, with Sam, Ruth, Chris, and, and uh, Will. Um, and the, the funny thing was, at um, what Chris said, one, one of the things Chris said, he's like, cook more. If we could just cook more, we would save a lot of things. We would save our health, uh, we might save our planet. But the fact is, like, we love to eat out, right? We absolutely love to go to restaurants and eat out. Um, I looked up some stats this morning, 
And uh, in two, 2020, we as a country spent $660 billion in restaurants. And there were 12.5 million workers in restaurants. But that is down from $900 billion and 15.6 million workers uh, the year before. So COVID has had a massive impact, uh, just a massive impact. And today, we're going to take both a kind of local and global um, glance into the food services industry. And we, have a, we love our restaurants here um, in, in Bar Harbor and on MDI. I'm so excited to have Michael here, Michael Boland, um, who is a dear friend of mine, a trustee of the, of the college, um, and Kara Stadler, who brings this amazing experience from, from Portland. And um, when we talk about f the food service industry and the restaurant business in general, it's, it's controversial. So we needed a, a really special person to manage that. And we are asking Francis Stead Sellers to do that, who is an alumna of the summer program who we love very, very dearly, comes to us from the Washington Post. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome the three of you to the stage and get this conversation started. Thank you. Do I get to have a hug before you go away? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Darren, so much. Well, what a, an enormous pleasure to be back here at the college um, and to see a group of friends out front and, and to have two friends here who have done so much for the restaurant scene in, uh, in Maine. So Kara Statler comes from further south in Maine, a coastal restaurant. She tells me so the way to remember her restaurant names is that they rhyme. Um, <laughs> so Bao Bao Dumpling, uh, Tao Yuan, Yuan, am I doing it well? And Zhao <laughs> Zhao Zhe, anyway. And she has the most fantastic greenhouse with an aquaponics um, top uh, where she will ha has fish and and greens growing. Um, Kara was also trained in some of the most high-end restaurants around the world. She's worked in, in, on the West Coast. She's worked in Philadelphia at the Striped Bass, which I'm familiar with. She then went out to Singapore and then went out further east to where her mother's family is from, Shanghai, and brings a lot of that flair back into the restaurant she's working on here. Michael, I'm sure, is familiar to many of you who know Havana and his other restaurants here in uh, Bar Harbor. Um, he's also a graduate of the college and a trustee of the college, so um, well known, I know, to many others of you here. Um, he's had restaurants in Winter Harbor and Portland, so not just here, and he's now branching out and I believe has a brewery in Western Maine, which I'm looking forward to learning about. Um, if you go into Havana, you will see that he has hosted President Obama and the First Lady there, so that's another feather in his cap. And he's been a member of the Chamber of Commerce for, and, and involved in many other charitable and good works around here in the town. So a very warm welcome to you both, Kara and Michael. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> so I think it's hard to to start any conversation about hospitality or service without thinking about the, the difficulties of this year. And um, those of us who've been eating know that how much we've depended on takeout and how we've seen restaurants pivot. But I would love to hear first from you, Kara, and then Michael, about what it took this year to turn these outward-facing places where you welcome people in into um, operations that serve takeout and did so Overnight, almost. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Um, I was in Asia about two weeks before they shut the airports down, so uh, the assumption that it was coming here and coming here quickly was very much in my mind. So we switched. I think the day after everything was closed, we have immediately flipped because we were preparing for it, and we were very fortunate. My my partner's my mom; she's very tech savvy, and we managed and very fortunate to have an online system ready to go the day indoor dining closed in Maine. So. And Chinese food, I was also very fortunate of all the things that Americans like to eat for to-go <laughs> food, it's pizza, Chinese food, and sandwiches. So we got incredibly lucky that our industry of the food, like the restaurant industry, our little facet did okay. Fine dining died, though, so my high-end restaurant's been closed since. Yeah. 
People do not like to eat nice food out of a box. <laughs> but, but so, you know, we, we saw these things going on the outside, but in the kitchen, you had to have people working together in somewhat in proximity, not knowing what this virus was going to do. How do you manage that end of things? Masking I mean, in the kitchen. Yeah, we masked. We asked all staff to basically not socialize um, if they wanted to stay working for us and to be made relatively like non-social so because we were all putting ourselves at risk in the groups that we were within and sort of staying in our own social bubble, which was a lot to ask of the staff to sort of stay more. But all of us, lots of us have partners who are compromised or have kids, and so the, yes, we have like very family-centric restaurant. It was very much everyone was on the same page. Nobody wanted to work in a place that was not safe, and all of us wanted to work because we needed to work. So it was either try to work together safely or just stop. And the idea of just stopping just wasn't really, some, for me, just wasn't an option. Right. So, yeah. so, so Michael, I'm remembering a, a Bar Harbor Facebook page talking about Havana closing down, I think probably last November, when there was some infection among employees of other restaurants possibly in the area, and you made a communal decision to work together. Is that right? You know, it sounds like we were <laughs> more thoughtful than we were. We were thoughtful about it, but what I mean by that is, you know, November is the end of the season anyway. And so it was a natural closure for, for us um, to, to choose that time. But certainly restaurants were very thoughtful the whole season, July, August, September, October. Kara was just pointing out, you know, that one of the most difficult things was ending that communal nature of a restaurant. And the staff is family. I know that's a cliche, but it truly is. At the end of the night, after a difficult night, um, you really do bond, and you usually bond, you know, getting together, either with a bottle of wine or some soda or whatever. That wasn't able to happen in the beginning of the pandemic, certainly towards right. the end of it when everyone was masked, and then and certainly now with vaccines, it, right. it has been easier. But, yeah, it was, it was difficult. So you, I mean, you have very diverse um, operations here. Not only Havana, I should have mentioned earlier, on the Islesford Dock, which is a, an extraordinary restaurant out on an island. And if you can think about staffing in a restaurant on an island, that has a challenge of, of its own. But you don't serve Chinese food. Pizza isn't your thing as far as I know. It's another, but how did you manage with takeout? Or were you just, you sort of staggered through the summer and then, how did, how did it work? So in the beginning in March and April, we were right around to open and, um, we actually just did a community meal, a free community meal. We, we contributed, but then we also had a couple of generous members of the community that contributed. So we did a, a big meal for three or 400 people many, uh, many weeks, uh, once a week. And that's, that was great. It was a great feeling. It was great to be able to help with the schools closed. And then when we reopened, we did to go, but you're right, paella is not something you think of to go. And it's difficult <laughs> to serve to go. Um, but we did it, we re-engineered our menu. Um, restaurateurs are creative, you know? There's a lot of attributes to them, I think, uh, generally, but one of it is creativity and inventiveness, and um, this really showed it all over the country, right? When right. people were forced to make, as you say, a well, really quick pivot. You know, that takes me back to, to one of the first stories I did early in the pandemic with a couple of other colleagues was about food banks and the, the the increase in hunger, this was in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, where there are a lot of migrant workers working in mushroom farms. And I know, having spoken to you both and, and learned about a little bit about your commitment to your own communities, that you really don't think of your restaurant as just a place that visitors come to, but you're embedded in the places you live in, your workers are living there. How, talk again about the, the pandemic and what it meant in terms of your relationship to the community and your responsibility as people who know how food works and, and how people need to eat who may not be as fortunate. I mean, I think, I think my first thoughts were also farmers, right. where we okay. buy so much product from so many farmers and all that product that restaurants consume, where, what are those farmers doing now? Though farmers did seem to land okay. The communities, I will say main communities are at least, really came out and supported local farms. And I think CSA shares went up tremendously and the support for sort of just the farmer's market went up, even though mm -hmm. it was, you were still walking in a weird line. I think most farms I talked to managed to fare okay. But I think about my oyster farm and what he did. And I feel bad because I was like, I've been buying oysters for you for years and now we're just, our business is done and we can't help you and how he fared through that. I think that was the first thing that went through my mind, sort of where the farmer community went. And Michael, you have this very unique <laughs> island community. It's very different from where, or from where Kara is further south with a, a more year-round community. 
what happened in terms of your relationship to the oysters are funny because we think <laughs> that they'll just sit in the water and then they're fine the next year they grow too big have you ever tried to eat really big oyster yeah. um, <laughs> they just get too big and the oyster farmers will tell you there's there's I, I can't sell these oysters now I'm gonna have to do something different with them um, with regard to the community, we've been here for a while, particularly Havana, and the Isles for Dock was there for 20 years before we took it over five years ago. And that's really embedded in an island community, right. of course. But right. for Havana, it's been there for 23 seasons now. So wow. we've really built some strong relationships up um, with the community in general. And that changed, but um, not dramatically. Again, in the way that we felt like we could actually give more with the community dinners, with just staying open and doing to go there were a lot of people right. even when things opened you know remember in july right. and august and september last year um there was a whole lot of people here on mount Stewart island people yeah. from new jersey and new york and pennsylvania were allowed to come in people right. from massachusetts weren't and they came um and <laughs> we were busy and they were inside and outside we were very careful maine as a, as a as a whole was of course very careful we had a very low incidence of covid um but I felt like just being open, keeping people employed that, that were able to be employed and that wanted to be employed still, um, uh, for all the reasons that Kara was mentioning, uh, family members at home that they just couldn't be, et cetera. Um, I felt like that was also a real, uh, a real bonus to our, the people that we work with and the farmers that we work with and, and our guests. So when I was doing research about both your places and your, your business and talked to you a little bit, You've both been expanding in a period when some people um, have been tightening down or closing down altogether. I think I used that term yesterday to Karen, and she said diversifying. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> corrected me quickly. But can you tell me about what, enable, what, you, what you're looking for, how diversification is working for you, and how you've been able to do it during this extraordinarily challenging year, but also a year for some people with opportunities and... Um, and needs to do things differently? Uh, I mean, the, we've definitely chosen to sort of diversify for the sake of stability, I think, and growing the company to the point where we can stabilize financially. And restaurants of this year, if anything's taught me, is are the most unstable businesses, with, with especially with the pandemic, but also they're just very unstable. And we were sort of discussing about sort of this huge shifts and huge changes happening in the industry that need to happen, that have, the pandemic has sort of forced, and the way that we source things has changed, and the supply chain has changed, in the sense that, yeah, be specific. even, in this, mean, even right. in this talk over this weekend, there's what, like, Jack Daniels is short this week, because there was a, a black, like, a, this was during the Ruth Reichel conversation that um, right. there was a... A, a glass bottle shortage, which then means Jack Daniels isn't going to make it to the island. But it's not just Jack Daniels. It's sort of everything that we've been... Oh, Chinese products have just flat out stopped right. for huge chunks of period of time because there's, right. cause we're having a trade war. Right. And this whole... Of anything, this year has sort of been like... that. The trade war caused me to change my business model and say, I need to make my own hot sauce. I can't get my hot sauce from China anymore, so I'm going to start buying peppers from here, fermenting them myself, and creating my own line of hot sauce because the reality is... is my supply chain has just been broken, and I need to change the way right. I'm going to find things. So in that sense, we started to grow our business to sort of fill the holes that have happened because of this year. Yeah. And you are looking at moving to Western Maine, which again seems like a community that, that, that would bring, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a community necessarily that has a reliable year-round um, I was surprised yes. at the year-round-ness of the community. Huh. Um, you know, we think of it as a winter place and right. because that's how we personally use it, right. my wife and I and our family. Um, but it's busy in the summer as well. Uh, it was a, an opportunity that made sense for us, and partially because it's a brewery. People are going to drink beer no matter what. Right. <laughs> and during the pandemic, they're going to drink as beer long, as we you know, as, as long as you can get the, even the grain, I guess, is something short. The brewers in Maine have been dealing with mm -hmm. just grain shipments. Um, so that, yeah, that whole aspect has been fascinating, frustrating, of course, first, but fascinating, too, to see the, the level of connections that restaurants have and that our whole society has in all different ways. Um, for us, um, Bethel is a place where we'll have a little bit of a life. We used to have a little bit of a life in the winter uh, away in Central and Latin right, America. Right, which we're going to come to. Alas, yeah. those days are over for now with two, two school-age kids. But, right. Um, but Bethel is a really beautiful little quintessential New England town. And as Kara was alluding to, the stability of the restaurant business. That was a restaurant that when we looked at the numbers over 
15 and 16, we looked at all the numbers historically, they were great. And right. they were consistent throughout the right. year. I was shocked that their July and August were just as good as their um, January and February. My January and February at Havana aren't that great. Right. And so to have that consistent revenue stream across the year, right. um, because you, you have costs no matter what, even if you're, and you know, you have costs particularly if you're going to be committed to being a little more stable for, for the people that you work with. And that's something we've tried to do at Havana is tried to stay open. Certainly any given week in November, December, January, February, we probably are posting a loss. Right. However, we're keeping people employed. Right. And we always give that choice particularly to Duffy, he's the major decision maker really at Havana, despite what people may think. And, you know, we say, is this a winner you want to be open? And he says, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll do that. Um, he's the bartender for many years there. Um, so he stays employed and he makes a fair living throughout, throughout that winter and as do some of our other employees. For that reason, um, you know, we've, knock on wood, been really fortunate with labor. I don't, I would bet that you so too that have been, because my experience is the restaurateurs that have always been focused on their employees as much as they can be. Um, you know, there's some difficulties with that, right? And mm -hmm. I'd love to be in an industry where there was enough financial cushion where I could offer health insurance to all my employees. Um, we used to, you know, we can't anymore. Um, we've got 60 employees at Havana. We try and do what we can in certain aspects for uh, Obama KCA and all that, but there, it is not financially feasible for a restaurant the size of Havana to offer health, uh, a health insurance group policy. I want to pursue that a little bit further, but I, I, you mentioned trade wars and how you had been, your, your supply chain had been affected by that. But immigration policy, again, we've had this huge churn, and you both, you have to have been affected by immigration policy. How do you adapt when HB visas and J1 visas get suspended? What? We open less days of the week, and people are pissed. That's it. That's a, I've had a lot of people just, just like, why aren't you open today? I was like, well, find me some staff, and I'll open. That's it. I'm like, that's the end of my conversation. Like, I do not have enough staff to open all my restaurants. And until I do, I won't, and we're just going to be open less. We make enough money to the people who work there and keep the building afloat, and we'll grow as we grow with people. But at this point, it's sort of like, I'm not also... I can't do the seven days. For me, like I, I've done the seven days a week in the summer where I've lost my life because I couldn't find staff. And I'm just, at, this is I think the thing that pandemic taught me was I'm not doing that anymore. There has to be some sense of stability for everybody in this company. So there has to be some guarantees of things that they have that every other industry manages to afford for their staff that we have not done yet. So right. we're trying to figure that out. How, would you staff up a lot during the summer? I mean, traditionally, do you? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, we're normally at, well, pre-pandemic, we were around 60, 50, 60 employees. I think we're down to under 30. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Baba was open for dinner service and lunch service five days a week. Now we're only open for dinner service five days a week because I can't staff for lunch. Mm -hmm. And then Tao is usually open five days a week. It's not at all open. And I had a third restaurant, which I closed, but that was a rent issue more than anything else. And then... That's the next thing, housing <laughs> I'm going to ask about, but I want Michael to talk about, about the um, visa thing. And then, uh, yeah, and then we opened our new space, but we only... We, we were planning on opening the space before the pandemic happened. We just got it open this year, so <laughs> it's been slow. So, Michael, your workers, I'm imagining, in the summer are somewhat tied in with other tourism industries here in Baja, but the hotels, which open more broadly. How has this immigration policy change affected you? I'm hoping for more changes. Yeah, I think right. we all are, right? <laughs> and hopefully we will under this right. administration. Um, you know, the, there's the two visas, right? The J-1, which is students, um, and you mm -hmm. can do it for five years in a row, and you have four months, I think. And then there's the H-2B. And the H-2B visas is a more permanent visa. It's renewable. Um, and many of the, uh, the Jamaican people mm -hmm. that are here on the island are under H-2Bs, and the Eastern European, in general, um, are under J-1s. Mm -hmm. And J-1s got cut off at the beginning of the pandemic. That was a really critical blow to the, I think there were, I think um, hospitality may said there were 11,000 J-1 visas yeah. in 2019, wow. and there were zero. So that's 11,000 right. people out of the workforce. There's only 1.1, 1.3 million people in Maine. That's a lot of employees all of a sudden gone. The H-2Bs, many of them were still in the country because, again, they're renewable. Um, so some of them could mobilize and get up here. Um, it's crucial. We're in a rural state with a, with a, a, a spread out population mm -hmm. base and um, we rely on it heavily. Um, I think that it's a great opportunity for J-1s. 
it seems like a lot of folks have managed to stay after they, you know, the whole thing is it's supposed to be a cultural exchange, right. not 90 hours a week. Right. Um, most of them are somewhere in between that cultural exchange right. and because they also want to make a good earning while they're here. But you made a point to me once, and I found it so interesting that, that, that in Bahaba, you can get people who don't have cars but have come here on a summer visa. What does this mean for, you've opened a place in Northeast um, recently, what does it mean for a community like Northeast or Seal Harbor or Southwest? It's much even? harder, much harder. Those are small towns, Southwest Harbor. Um, a lot of those folks will take second jobs, particularly the H2B visas. They'll only get 30 or 35 or 40 hours, and they want to do an extra 10 or 15 hours hmm. for the summer, make hay while the sun shines, that kind of thing. And they will be able to walk somewhere or take a bike somewhere, but right. they're not here with cars. And so, yeah, it's tougher there for sure. Right. So you mentioned a rent issue, but housing, again, a transformation that's happened in the society that didn't come out of restaurants but affects you. Um, people have, you know, given their small spaces over to Airbnb. Um, I see it happening. It's not certainly not unique to hear those. NPR did a story out of Crested Butte. You see it in New Orleans, other touristy areas. How do you accommodate people who are here for a short amount of time? Um, I will tell you that right now I have two roommates <laughs> <laughs> who are J-1 visa people because I have them working for me and they, it's a random situation and the place they were staying, I was like, you can't stay here and I have a spare room and this is nuts. Um, but also, I think I've, we've been talking about, I mean, this conversation, you bought housing for your staff, and I want to talk to restaurants in Portland and be like, we need to figure out a way to think about our labor needs. And the problem is we're all too small businesses. We're all small businesses that we're not connected, and we don't have our sh together to, like, organize ourselves and find a building. Like, we need to do this. It's like we need to find someone, or someone has to be a point person for all of us because we need the labor. And I think if we had it, it would be a huge relief for all of us. But the organization to get there is its, its own beast, and that means finding housing and applying for the visas. And it's a lot of work. It's time. I think it's like, all, as a small business owner, and like all the other small restaurant owners I know, the issue is we just don't have much time. Mm. And the added time to take on another huge endeavor, like finding staff for, which would be the thing that would alleviate time. Like, just getting there seems like an impossible hurdle. Almost. Right, so you're sort yes. of on a yeah. bad circle of, yeah. yeah, you can't do one thing because you're caught up with the other. That's and a neat idea. We just, I, with another restaurateur, I just talked about that idea. That's really neat to get a couple of restaurants together and buy either a small motel and convert it into yeah. permanent living or something because you can pool your resources and do it. We. We were talking about a building outside of town and said we should get four of us together and, and have more housing. Because let's face it, the invisible hand of Adam Smith, the marketplace is not going to do it, right? It's only going right. to go in one direction. Right. People are going to say, how much money can I make from right. my property? What's right. the most money I can make from my property? And that's what I'll do with it, right? And government is probably not going to do it. I am a left-leaning big government fan, but government is usually not going to do it, especially small town governments. They just don't have the resources, they don't have the, the capacity to figure out what, what worked on Martha's Vineyard or what worked in Nantucket or what didn't work. In well, those actually, that's interesting. Are you having conversations with other, with Martha's Vineyard or other similar places or, you know, high tourist places to discover whether they're coming well, up with that's, solutions? Well, that's my point. I think that a lot of these small towns and even Portland's are right. just too small to have those resources as those resources in government to actually be able to do that. They're just trying to keep up with sending out property tax notices, right? right? That, you know, to, to look at other communities is a big study that you have to undertake. You can hire an outside surveyor, but um, I think the interesting thing for me about this, this discussion about um, housing and about it really underlines how tied in restaurants are to the community and, and what we do and how complex of an issue things like wages and labor and staffing a restaurant and feeding people really are. It really is tied into these big issues right. that we're dealing with in well, society. Yeah, so let me ask internationally, because you both have these connections to, to distant parts of the world. You to Chiapas and Mexico, where I think you used to spend every winter. And of course, your heritage is, is in China, in Shanghai. Your mother's family is from there, and that's influenced your, your cooking. Havana is named Havana, I'm sure, for a reason. Talk to me a little bit, both of you, about the importance of the cultural bridges that restaurants can be in the places you have located them and your sense of connection to these countries what it means for the food but also for the spirit of the place and the communities you're in now here in maine um 
Well, honest, I moved Huge to, question, uh, sorry. No, I, well, part of it is like, I, when I moved to Maine, actually, I was never intending to open up an Asian restaurant. I spent my entire career mostly in fine dining French food, working in three Michelin star French restaurants. Well, yeah, restaurants. tell us a little bit about that. Really fine well, dining. Like very right? fine dining. Very fine like, dining. Very, that's it, three Michelin stars, two Michelin stars, the best of the best, the best product in the world, all French technique. And the French feel that they have the best food, bar none. Um, have, <laughs> <laughs> like, of which having you know, spent time there, I was amazing. And then realizing as I was working in a three mission star restaurant that my sous chef at the time didn't know what pho was. It just like, and I was like, and I'm done. <laughs> that was it. I'm like, this is where I'm like, you've just culturally cut yourself off from so much of the world. This right. is even your colony. This is your colony. And you don't know what it is. <laughs> like, on top of that, like, this is a country that made this dish because you colonized them and you don't even understand the history of that dish. And then I was like, this is, so I left. I also got booted out because of a visa issue and ended up in Asia. And, um, and then when I came back to the States, I thought I should get back into French food, fine dining is where money is. And then something just sort of shifted as I got to Maine and the idea of like starting my own place and what I wanted to do. And we ended up opening an Asian restaurant because there wasn't that much of it and there's, I know a lot about it. Um, and I now am very tied to it and I'm, it's very important to me to bring culture, like dishes that I've made and know from those countries back to here because I feel like, I mean, there's a lot of a cultural appropriation that exists in this world and it pains me a lot and being someone who's been to these places and I feel like has some understanding and some of it is my own heritage, I'd like to bring some authenticity and share it with the people who like it. Okay, so that'd be provo provocative. Do you bring French cooking techniques to Chinese foods to America? Yes, with main ingredients. With main ingredients, okay. <laughs> like so give me an really example, be specific. <laughs> Tell me, make my mouth water. <laughs> well, I'm, no, I mean, we just, that, like, that is Tao. Tao is, is what is local here mixed with a huge understanding of French technique and building of sauces and broths and bone broths that I think is essential and what makes sort of French cuisine really phenomenal is their development of those flavors and then also all the intensity of and heat and excitement of Asian cuisine. I do think European cuisine is actually just really boring because it doesn't have access to any really intense flavors. It's just, just think of its climate. It's boring. <laughs> it is. It just doesn't have heat. It doesn't have, it doesn't have the range of spices. And like what makes anything around the tropics amazing is that variation and that intensity of flavor that comes from just the food that is grown there. Yeah. So you just smash it all together and it's something different. <laughs> and then Chiapas. And that difficult notion of cultural appropriation as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for the for the protesters outside Havana any <laughs> day now. Yeah, um, I might rename my last name Volano or something. But <laughs> we get asked all the time, "Are you Cuban?" I say, "Not, I haven't even been there. It's just a gimmick." Um, but it isn't. But of actually, we no. We love Latin talk America. We yes. spent most of our lives there. My wife and I spent many winters in Brazil and. Um, have traveled all over Latin America, but really have lived there as well. But you spent half a year there for many, we many years. We sent our daughter to school there right. in San Cristobal de las Casas in Chiapas, but also lived in Tulum for a while. And yeah, it wasn't just a week trip and like, oh, I'm Mexican now. Right. It was, um, you know, we lived there. We loved it. We, um, uh, and still do. But, you know, there is that. There is that aspect of like, do I have the right to, to open a Latin restaurant? I think I do. Um, there might be people think that I don't, um, but um, but as I, I think, judge, based on what you were getting at too, is I love that we're bringing that that style of food too to Maine and right. to this community, and right. um, and that a little bit of that culture as well. Right. No. Go ahead. Well, I would, I would say that it's more as cultural version. The thing that frustrates me as someone is when I read or eat things. It's most actually for more often reading it than even, even eating it and realizing like this person is putting a name on something with no fundamental understanding of what that name means. And that's the rub. Like it's like, it's Bon Mi spelled the German way. <laughs> you know, that's like you didn't, you didn't even try. You didn't even try. Yeah, and I didn't take your suggestion. <laughs> so, and like that, I guess. about it as, as towards. I cook Thai food, I cook Japanese food, I cook Korean food, I am not Thai, Japanese, or Korean. Like right. these are not, but they're things that I love. And I think the thing is just understanding where the root is and just having some respect of that culture before. Right. And I think there's, a, there's lots of people doing tremendous justice to it and there's lots who are not. So, so then the whole notion of fusion is something, I mean, you talk, I think about fusion in your food. I'm not, uh, yeah, talk a little bit about that. I mean, this blending of ideas and cultures and um, the unusual, the innovative things that can, can come from it. 
I mean, in the sense that I don't think anything that I make is truly authentic because it roots itself in Maine, though it, it's all the flavors that are here. Everything we make, we make dishes like, I've had cow soy from long grain, I think it's phenomenal, but it will never be the same as a cow soy from Thailand because they source their ingredients here and they are rooting it here in this area. It's sort of like that's what, that is what in my mind fusion is transforming sort of people making what they know with what they can find and it morphing into a whole new cuisine. Right. Right. And that makes a delicious fusion in my mind. Right, right. Your new restaurant in, um, in uh, Northeast also has a Latin, a Latin name and a Latin flavor to it. Um, well, um, I do have a mic coming. Oh, right. there we go. Another mic coming. I got it, I think. I think you're back. Yeah. You're back. Um, I do have Italian heritage, so I can claim that for, <laughs> for Coquita a little bit. It is Mediterranean, so... Um, right. And it's meant, copita means, you know, the little glass that they use for sherry in the south of Spain. So it's, it's meant to be Mediterranean, southern Spain, southern France, Italian. But um, it's a comfortable atmosphere. I mean, that's part of it, right? Is, is right. Certainly the food oh. is, is front and center. Right. But there's also what we're creating for people to be comfortable in. Um, and uh, the space itself. And to, to continue my cultural appropriation, the... The, and help me the pronunciation, the feng shui, right? The feng shui of it is just the flow of the space and how you feel in a space. And Copita is just a great little space. I think there's an Irish feng shui for Irish pubs, right? The Irish just know how to make a pub right. so that when you walk, everybody says, oh, it's an Irish bar, it's an Irish bar. What does that mean? I, I think there's just a way that a pub is designed that just makes you feel good. You're, you don't have your back to the, to the door when you're sitting at the bar so you can look over and see who's coming in. Oh, it's, it's, it's Susan, it's Tommy. Um, and I think that Copita's got that going on. And there are so many of those aspects in, in a right. restaurant, right? right? And the Isles right. for Doc is a good example right. of it, too. So yesterday, those of you who were here heard from Sam Sifton and Ruth Reichel, and they are very loud voices in the food world. What does it mean, food criticism, what does it mean for a restaurant now to have um, somebody coming in, potential views, reviews in those places. And on the other side, TripAdvisor and the sort of democratization of restaurant criticism. Where, what's it, how do you respond? Um, how do you think about, how, how do you respond to the people's comments <laughs> as well as to the high-end comments, which must have a huge influence on who comes in? I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I stopped with Yelp a long time ago. There's you stopped two, I, with Yelp. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's so much racism on it. I just like I just dropped. It's also just a place for people to, who are angry. So you're not sitting there monitoring it, thinking we. No, right. and I just, hope Yelp dies with the pandemic. That's one of the things I do hope just goes away. I just like think it's a terrible. I think it's terrible. I think pe it's for people to let. It's for angry people to troll restaurants or establishments who like just want to let out. I'm not saying that sourced reviews are bad things. I just specifically think Yelp is a place for people to just let out. And I have like disgruntled employees who've written bad reviews on Yelp for me. So it's just, you know, what are you going right. to do? At some right. point, it's like, we're going to get trashed no matter what. And then for reviewers, I think it's time to stop rating restaurants. Stop rating? I think it's time to stop rating restaurants. I think it's time to stop putting a rating on a restaurant. I think... Most, no stars. No stars. I think you can say something's delicious or not. I think you think something's wonderful or not wonderful, but I think it's time to stop rating things on, on food. I think there's too much food that people don't even understand that you don't get to, you don't know enough to judge it. So that's how I think like you can say that something's wonderful and experience is different, but I think the stars have to stop because I think, I just, I think I'll, I think even someone who's incredibly educated in one cuisine can have know nothing about another one. And I just don't think there are enough I think there's very few people have access to that. So, given the kind base. of democratization of criticism that we were talking about yeah. with Yelp and other places, how much do those big reviews matter in terms of who comes, how many people come yet next to your restaurant? Huge. Huge. I think shining lights on establishments that are making delicious food, that are sourcing it well, like shining a light on the Isles for Dock, is like that's the that's those, but not to I said to shine a light on the dock, but not to criticize. I guess to not to like nitpick at it, to more just shine a light on the business because you know it's a good business and making good food with good people. Like, that's what needs to happen. And less the, this is the place with the most expensive dish in the most beautiful setting, and it's a perfectly cooked lobster tail. I think, like, that's the irrelevant. 
Where do you stand on all that? I, I think half of it, at least, is just entertainment at this point for people, right? I mean, are we really reading a TripAdvisor right. review and basing our decision on where to go based on that? Um, we'll ask the people out there. <laughs> we'll hear from them both. Um, I, I, and I agree 100%. We should have had a heads up, right? It is named Yelp, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> like, we should have known what was coming. They named their company Yelp. Um, so I, I do read TripAdvisor and the, you know, the new one is Google. Everybody's using Google. Um, and sometimes I'll get uh, some important feedback. You know, someone will say something that is valuable. One out of ten. The other nine are exactly what you, you described. I will admit to occasionally responding to those, and I think it's more out of my desire or my the fact that I, I think I'm a frustrated writer. I think I wanted to be a writer or maybe could have been a writer, so I, I take that avenue and um, choose to respond to some of those reviews uh, because some of them, of course, are just flat out untrue, and, and you do feel that need. And, and it's probably better to never respond yeah. <laughs> and to just give it up. But I, I, haven't, I haven't evolved to that, that point yet. Um, I don't think, to answer your I don't think they matter really at all as far as one bad review or two bad reviews. Um, I don't know. We're busy and we get bad reviews all the time. Not all the time, but occasionally people say, I waited too long or this or that. But it's a, it's a weird thing. So I have a few minutes um, before I open it up to questions, and I know there will be eager questions. Later on this morning, I'm going to be talking to Saru Jairaman about um, wages in the restaurant industry. And I'd love to talk to you both before we go ahead into that conversation about how we manage a system that seems from an outsider's perspective to depend so much on tips. The tip level has gone up in my memory since coming to this country and is very different from the country I came from. So, Michael, do you want to plunge in to this area that I'll be exploring in greater detail with Saru and just talk about, you, you, you mentioned earlier on um, that you can't provide health insurance to everybody. You've got this workforce that comes seasonally. Can you talk about um, this whole debate over uh, minimum wage, sub-minimum wage, and tipping? Not in three minutes. Not in three minutes. We might I mean, give you I think four. that's part of the problem. <laughs> I think that, that right. when we try and um, reduce anything that's this complex, and it is complex. If people tell you it isn't, they're wrong, just flat out. If you try and reduce something down to a, a, a slogan or a, something that will fit on a placard, you're going to get it wrong. Um, I think that's one of the great things that I hopefully learned at COA during my time at COA is that Issues are really complex and that you better spend an awful lot of time examining all the angles of them. Um, you know, you, right here on the coast of Maine, you can say save the whales, which of course I'm all in favor of, but then go talk to all the lobster fishermen out on Little Cranberry Island and talk to them about how it's going to go to switching over to ropeless gear. So just using that as an example. Right. This wage issue, again, as we've already touched on in this short time with housing, um, with wages, um, with the tip minimum wage, with trying to have a little bit more equity, so that's a whole other issue that people don't talk about. And you can, you know, if you've been in the kitchen the whole time and you have a server come in at the end of the night and say, "I just made six hundred dollars," and you've been in the kitchen and, and you were making even if twenty dollars an hour, like I, I just worked just as hard and I only made. So there's so many complicated issues in, in every industry, but in the restaurant business surrounding wages, that um, I, I think it's worth a long discussion and I think it's worth really examining. Um, particularly the tip minimum wage. Maybe this society, maybe tips are a source of sexual harassment. They certainly, it's not a maybe, they are. But paralegals are, have to deal with sexual harassment. There, there are so many complicated issues around it um, that I think it deserves more time than has been spent. And I think it's become a political issue. The right, of course, will say, you know, you're not getting employees because um, of unemployment. And the left will say, you're not getting employees because restaurateurs are basically slave labor, right? Well, neither one's accurate, right? There's somewhere in the middle is a little bit of the truth. So um, I, I feel strongly about it, but interestingly, I don't feel strongly either way. I don't feel like we need to keep the tip minimum wage or we don't need to keep the tip minimum wage. We need to get rid of it. What I do feel strongly is we need to really think about it and have more conversations about it. And do you, I mean, do you hope for some sort of federal oversight or policy change over this that would take the, you know, the issues that you've been grappling with locally and manage them on a... Absolutely. I think level. if we're going to do something, it should be across the board as an entire governmental action, but also as a societal action. 
there's a lot. You can say, well, let's get rid of the tip minimum wage, which, by the way, really quickly is if the minimum wage in a state is $10, many states allow you to pay 50% less than the minimum wage. So you could pay your servers $5 as long as they're making, of course, places, up to the minimum wage. Right. Now, remember, the servers are actually making more like $40 or $50 an hour. So the tip minimum wage in almost all instances is meaningless. So then why not make it 10, you might ask? Um, well, because then that's out of the restaurateur's pocket and the servers are doing very well to begin with, um, or at least in many cases. Many cases they're not, right? Um, I think that it's a big societal change and a governmental change all at once instead of trying to piecemeal it state by state or restaurant by restaurant because this is something you've got more so, Cara, you, I'd love to hear oh, yeah, from you. We've got like we, two minutes before we go over. That wasn't um, give you four. going to give you... <laughs> We, uh, we took, took tips away, and it backfired uh, miserably. Say, say that again. You we took tips. We right. took tips away four years ago. Right. Around then. Sorry, I'm just a little cold. Yeah, um, no, just chilly up here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we took tips away a couple years ago, and it backfired. We lost $50,000 in three months, like in negative $50,000 in three months. We're like, this is why? This is crazy. What are we doing? Uh, people, we, the only way to do it in the state of Maine at the time was to increase prices and remove the service charge. Because unless you're a private club, you can't have a service charge. There's so many convoluted rules surrounding tips, and it's so stupid. <laughs> this is how I feel about it. And I, I have very strong feelings about it. I think they should go. I think they should just completely go. The government needs to set it up that way, or the society needs to make a fundamental change. It will not change until we all, fun like a single restaurant will never do it. And small restaurant groups doing it won't make the change. I think it has to be a government shift for it to change. Tips are messed up, they shouldn't exist, they create page, sorry, wage inequality between the front and back of house, between the, even in the front of house where bartenders and servers get different amounts of tips. Certain managers can control tip sections. If you have one section, you can get screwed. Your manager can physically make your night a miserable living hell, excuse my language, and then I'll give you a section that has the worst guest, all the foreigners who don't tip anyway, so you just spent your whole night working for $5 an hour, getting stiffed by all your tables. You don't pool in the house, nobody on the team likes you, you walk away with nothing Talk that to night. Talk more about wage inequality, because of course in every industry there's wage inequality. The attorney makes more than the paralegal. Yes, but our wage inequality has a junior server coming in who's been in this industry for two weeks making more money than the line cook who's been right. there for two so years. Right. That right. is insane, like, right. and it's infuriating. And as an owner, to distribute tips that way and to watch this 17-year-old, two-week new server walk in, walk out, breeze in, usually white. And, and as a former line cook. And no, well, no, it's not a no, man, uh, sometimes. You're, you're yeah, and as a, I'm line a line cook. Oh, right. like, I right. spent my industry in the right. kitchen. I spent my entire career in the kitchen. The reason I stayed in the kitchen was because I was like, I can be the owner of my own business if I'm a cook. And I look at you servers, and I think, you're never going to own the place. That's why I stayed in the kitchen. That's literally it. It's like, I'm going to be the one who can run the kitchen and run the whole show. But that shouldn't really be a thing that a 16-year-old has to think about when they're choosing their, I don't know, just like it just shouldn't, be a, it shouldn't even be, have been a conversation in my head. Right. And that's the establishment. That's our establishment. And it needs to be broken. It needs to be broken. Well, on that note, let's open it up to questions. See. <laughs> Thank you both so much. It was just so fantastic. Um, we have mics. We have Wes and Sean out there with mics, so please put up your hands. If I don't spot you, there's a hand right in the middle here. You'll get a mic from either Sean's coming down here, and um, our audience will be able to hear the questions as this is being beamed out. Hi. So. Um, oh, it's, it's okay. In the Bay Area of California, they've put, <laughs> up, I think it's a 3% tax on top of restaurant bills to pay for health care for the workers. Has that been considered here at all? It shouldn't have to be considered. <laughs> <laughs> like, it shouldn't be. We should find systems that don't have force us to, we either need to flatline increase prices of what we're selling, and the, we need to spend more money on food and the way we pay people, and we shouldn't have to have individual establishments add the stupid tax at the end of their check, which is just going to piss off their guest. It just... Like, the health insurance system is also broken. The fact that right. we don't offer it as a baseline is crazy to me. And like, we do offer it, but we offer, the, I like, we, we offer, I'm like embarrassed about what we offer. And I offer it to my own self, it's, what I, it's my health insurance, it's not great. But it's what we can offer, and it frustrates me that I'm tied also to a system that I have no control over and just keeps going up in price and offers me less and less in return. Like, and that's our health insurance system, which is its own frustrating political conversation. <laughs> Next question, we've got one right back there in the... Sorry. 
Hi, thank you all for this super fascinating conversation. So, you know, we're, we're hearing that this is a crazy industry, right? Like, you can't afford health insurance for your employees, you're dependent on H2B and J1 workers. And Michael, you said, like, the, the government's not gonna fix it in most cases. Imagine that weren't true, right? Imagine the government were going to fix it. What are the kinds of federal policies that would actually help the industry? Like, you're talking about individual restaurants shouldn't have to do this. What kind of national changes would help your industries? And I want to add that because our national changes, sorry, going to work from state to state. We have some states that are very cheap to live in and others that are not. So, Michael, sorry to give you the hard one with an added twist to it. Well, it's simple. You just mentioned it. Change our entire health insurance system in the country, right? Right off the bat, that would really help. Make health insurance a, you know, a, a right, not, not something that you have to fight and scrape for, right? Let's start with that. Um, I think that would change the restaurant industry dramatically. Um, I think that it would change 30 to 40% of the problems in the restaurant industry. Yeah. Do you want to add to that, Karen, anyway? I mean, I mean just, just eliminate tips. Just eliminate them. Just get rid of them. Just remove tipping. So actually, I, I have a question. It's one I'm going to ask Sarah as well about, about electronic payment now. So many of us see being asked for tips for things that are, you know, are actually take out or at the bakery or somewhere else. Has the, the, the request for tips in your view, spread, and, and, and is that? Yeah, I mean, I find it, I, as a, as a restaurant owner, I also sometimes am very frustrated because sometimes I buy a coffee and I also buy all my baked goods and I buy local bread and I'll buy a lot of other things. And in my mind, all you're doing is putting something in a bag and now I'm tipping you 20% on a ton of stuff that has, that's going to you and not to the person who made the bread. And does that mean I should tip the extra money or not? And why is this a conversation I have to have in my head when I'm buying a coffee? And I do feel like I should tip on the coffee because I'm making a latte, and that's like an extra amount of effort. And that's an interaction every day right. that's incredibly frustrating. And if you just got rid of tips and you factored the price into what you sold, this wouldn't be a conversation. Right. That's it, and it eliminates everything. It just it kills all the problems. <laughs> Another question out here. Michael, I really appreciate your call for more nuanced conversations. I think m most of us here are very likely against the um, proposed salmon farm in Frenchman Bay, but aquaculture, not only with shellfish, but fi fin fish may need a more nuanced discussion. I don't know at Havana if you serve farm salmon. In, um, in vegetables, we're always curious about where the vegetables come from. Now we're beginning to think about where our fish comes from. Do you have any more nuanced thoughts on this subject? Thanks. Yeah, I, sustainable seafood has been one of the passions that I've had since the day we opened, um, or even before that, when I had Rupanuni and started in 1994. So I love that you asked it. Thank you. Um, and sometimes we don't need nuance. The salmon farm shouldn't go in French from Bay, period. <laughs> right? I mean, um, you know, uh, sure, maybe we should take another look and just make sure that we're right on that one. But I think that we, we all know that it's, it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, maybe it should go in, in Blue Hill Bay or maybe it should go up near Subin. But I, I, anyway, um, we've looked at where our seafood comes from always. Uh, and. You're right, it's been a wrestle, particularly with salmon. Thank you for that one. We took it off, we put it back on, we've taken it off, we've only bought wild Alaskan at one point. We don't have it on the menu at Havana right now um, because it is so complex. And of course, you're probably familiar with Monterey Bay Aquarium, which has the app on your phone. I tell our guests all the time, well, you should download this app, it's free, and then you can search for a fish. If you're down in Florida and you wanna eat red snapper, put red snapper in. It'll show you whether it's on the green light, the yellow light, or the red light. Do huh. not eat, do not order. Huh. You know, everybody knows the story about Chilean sea bass and these other really prominent species, but there's so many species that really are things that we should not be eating until we figure out a way, a better way to either raise them um, or catch them. Interestingly, right here in Frenchman Bay, there's an amazing aquaculture uh, um, family, the De Koenigs, uh, they're from the Netherlands and they came here and started a mussel farm in Frenchman Bay, not on ropes, really, um, they, they did all the science and figured out where they could best raise mussels based on salinity and current, 
um, temperature of the water, um, everything. Then they lease those bottoms from the state and they put the mussels on the bottom. They put the seed on the bottom. Naturally, that's the way they are and they have a mussel bed there. Then they come back three years later and harvest them. So really low impact. They're not, they're not dragging in an area where they're also at, you know, affecting other areas of the bottom. They're dragging in an area right where they lease and where their mussels are. Um, it's a great example of a really amazing aquaculture that is really low impact and amazing mussels. So, yeah. I, I, we've got two minutes left. I think maybe Kara, you have this aquaponics um, <laughs> innovation going on. I mean, we, we do fin fish and we do it on in, in the basement and we really aren't far, farming fish for the, for the fish. We're doing it for the plants. Actually, right. the fish poop, it's a whole so closed system. So circular... The whole idea is the fish poop feeds the plants and that the plants also filter some of the water, but we still filter it, and that it creates a closed-loop system that doesn't need excess water to top off. So you, for places like California, it's a great way to not use a tremendous amount of water in your system. Um, but we aren't doing it for the purpose of fish farming, and fish farming is one of the most complicated forms of farming and less done in, like, with multiple other things going at the same time, because if you just drop a fin fish farm anywhere, you're just going to destroy the ecosystem. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's complicated, and it has to have all these other systems going with it because fish need these systems to help them or they destroy their environment. I mean, like, the amount of ammonia out of there, like, is insane. It's just an insane... It's, you know, it's farming. It's not a very beautiful thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but it does... If it's done right and, and with other systems in place, you can create this really magical thing, but you ha it does need the plants, and we were thinking about doing vermiculture, too, is getting bugs to feed the fish sort of into that system too to create this singular system. Um, so if there's one message I've taken away from this wonderful discussion, it's, it's complicated, <laughs> which is what you just said. So Kara Statler and Michael Boland, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Now that was... Thank you for sharing your insights, for the, taking us behind the kitchen door. And I'm going to be back in half an hour with Saru, and so please stick around. And uh, I, I was just going to say that. You were going to say that. Yeah, okay. I'm just used to doing this. <laughs> the, <laughs> the one thing before, like, I realized um, what my dad was doing was this Irish main fusion that with the lobster. There you go. The Irish, Irish main oh, fusion. Which is good. <laughs> but the funny thing is when I sat down, my wife, gave me this massive elbow and she said, I can't believe you said, don't open a restaurant. <laughs> and I said, I didn't say that, my dad said I, it. I was gonna comment on that, <laughs> Siren, and, and, and I will take this quick moment to comment. You would have been a great restaurateur. And, and there is often that little, that little Next thing about career. restaurateurs, right? And you know what, I don't complain about attorneys. Yeah, I do complain about attorneys, but <laughs> accountants, they all lead wonderful lives and contribute. Restaurant tours, it's a really intimate thing that we do, right? We're feeding people, and it's a really honorable calling, and I, I, right. I have a little mild resentment to that comment. To my dad. <laughs> to my dad. That's um, fine. Right and now. I'm very happy you became the president of this but, amazing institution, no, but, but like, I, I, I think you would have made a great <laughs> restaurant tour because you've got the passion, you love people, and, and you love food, and, you know, that's it's what it's about. It's a really intimate thing. It was thing, all about and, passion. And, yeah. And I, I do. I love, I love the industry, but, and I think what we're learning is, like, whether you're... You've got your hands in the dirt, um, or you're in the restaurant. Like food is a hard, hard business, and it requires people to be really, really creative across all, the entire the entire operation. So th thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.